um, um, Earl Spencer. Uh, I read his book uh, about the um, uh, to kill a king, about the regicides, the uh, the them the people during the Civil War who signed the um, uh, death warrant of Charles I, put him on trial. He wrote a really good book uh, about that, and uh, I thought uh, he'd be a good person to approach uh, and encourage him to might have some interest in this. Also encouraging to support the uh, petition to save the Bradley Lord Law. Uh, so I sent him lots of material uh, and uh, told him how much I liked his book. I got a, a, an email back that I can sort of remember word for word from his uh, associate assistant, which was that uh, Lordship declined uh, uh, the invitation. Uh, he has never heard of it. Very disappointing and surprising because I think even if you don't know what Charles Bradlaw did or what happened in this town in the 19th century, um, you, everybody who lives in Northampton has heard of that name or know the statue and know a little bit about him. And when I came here in um, 1984, I suppose I knew of him for um, a few years. Uh, uh, I knew he was a Republican and atheist, I didn't know much more than that. But what uh, uh, sparked my interest was if you look on the handout there of the photograph of the unveiling of the statue, all of the, uh, the, the sea of people in Abington Square on, the, on the, uh, the day of the unveiling of the statue, that's what sparked my interest. Uh, what, what, why did they like this man? What was the, uh, why was this, this special relationship between Bradlaugh and the people of Northampton? And uh, so in, in, in recent years I've been trying to find that out and answer some of those questions and I hope I can sort of make it a bit clearer today uh, through um, our, our walk. But our Old Saints Church here um, has been this sort of the sort of very grand um, high church, kind of the centre of the establishment in Northampton. Um, um, for, 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 since the, the, the 17th century, um, Northampton has a uh, has a Northampton cheer, also has a reputation for being uh, rebellious. Um, but in uh, in this church in uh, 1603, um, they were sort of preaching. They were talking about the ungodly level of activism that was going on <coughs> in. Um, Newton and places near Northampton where like, the common people were challenging the enclosures of the land there. The king gave permission for the uh, powerful families to sort of deal with those sort of commoners protesting and they, they sort of butchered them, a large number of them at Newton. And this, this church was preaching against that sort of activity there. Uh, prior to that, I forgot to mention that we also had the troublesome priest um, Thomas de Beckett, who was on trial in Northampton Castle, uh, where the station stands now, uh, in uh, 1164. The Great Fire of Northampton of uh, 1675 burnt down three quarters of the town, including the old All Saints Church, which was built, uh, um, and uh, m much of the town was rebuilt. Um, the uh, Daniel Defoe described uh, Northampton then as the handsomest and best built town in this part of all of England. The political levellers within the army uh, in 1649 occupied Northampton as they were escaping the suppression of their movement at uh, Banbury. Captain William Thompson and his group uh, occupied, and his troop occupied Northampton for a day before uh, we saw they were heading off to be sh uh, for the shelter of Rockingham Forest where they would be safe, but they were being pursued by Cromwell's troops. They, they, they released level of prisoners in Northampton. There was sort of sympathy, sympathy for them in Northampton. The day after, they were, they were Cromwell's troops caught up with them uh, uh, on the old Kettering Road near Walgrave, and Captain Thompson died fighting to the end. He could have escaped, they were hopelessly overwhelmed, but they brought his body back on the back of a horse, and raided it round the market square as an example, and then they buried him in the churchyard here of all saints. Um, so, to Northampton uh, to, and Bradlaugh. Bradlaw came here at, at, for a, a few years really before, he, before the 1858 election campaign. At the age of 24 in um, 1857, 
he took up an invitation to two uh, local secularists, uh, um, Joseph Gurney uh, and um, Oliver Adams, best known as the Master Baker. He used to have shops, his family had shops around the town. There's one there, I'm not sure if it's still called Adams, Ad not called Adams is now. Gregson. So he was invited to talk. <coughs> oh, he was a guest of the uh, Northampton Town and County Benefit Building Society, better known as the Freehold Land Society, which uh, helped ordinary people build their own homes. Uh, there'd been cholera in the town a few years earlier, down, uh, in the area, Bridge Street area. There was a lot of overcrowding. The town was growing rapidly at that time. So Bradford came and he spoke on uh, uh, theological issues. He spoke uh, on the uh, uh, 30th of, ja uh, of January in uh, 1869 to, uh, uh, to uh, a crowded and uh, orderly audience at the Woolpack Inn on Kingswell Street. He spoke on Jesus Christ and then again atheism is preferable to theism. Um, a few weeks later he came again, he was invited again. Uh, and he spoke at the theatre uh, to a set debate with Mr. John Bowles, a well-known opponent of free thinkers. So this was a debate on the pr proposition, atheism and secularism do not provide for the wants want, but foster the vices of the human race. But uh, he, uh, he was back again, or he was associated with the town um, some years later, um, A couple of years later, when the Reverend Sidney Gedge of this establishment reintroduced the Vickers tax or the tithe on local citizens, local secularists and non-conformists have resisted and opposed this tax. And uh, one of the, um, a, a guy called John Bates, who was a secularist, had a shop on the drapery here. He put two posters in his window, one in response to this Vickers uh, action. Um, one, an, art, uh, an article by Bradlaugh, but also another by a non-conformist, um, uh, criticising sort of tithes. Uh, Gedge, the vicar here, brought an action of libel against Bates, and then Bates libeled the vicar uh, uh, in the, in, in the uh, a magazine called The English Churchman. Bradlaugh wrote a letter to the vicar, and this letter uh, was also published in the National Reformer, Bradlaugh's paper. Um, you are a good and faithful shepherd doubter, but you have more regard for the wool than the sheep, and have an open eye, open eye for the shearing. Again, uh, he lost the case, uh, the vicar lost the case in the end, and that was overturned. So, it's, uh, Bradlaugh um, was uh, a leading figure in the uh, Reform League, which was campaigning for uh, a widening of the franchise of votes for ordinary people in the uh, mid 1860s. And uh, he spoke in a meeting at the Guildhall uh, 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 with the uh, uh, part of the Reform League uh, in, in 1866. In 1867, the Reform Act was introduced by uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Israeli called Israeli sort of shot in the dark. It was that he brought in electoral reform because he knew that if he didn't, the Liberals would bring it in. His hope was that that would increase the Conservative vote. In the end, it, it was a sort of Liberal landslide, but this was seen as an opportunity for uh, candidate people like Bradlaugh who, who were, wanted to uh, stand as an MP and represent like the, the working classes, the, 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 the uh, people who just got the vote, uh, to represent them. I say represent uh, the working class, the, the reform was that heads of household got the vote. It wasn't all adult males or females. Bradlaugh wanted females to have the vote, women to have the vote too, you know, 50, hours, 50 years ahead of the, uh, you know, the reform act that uh, brought in the votes for women. But that was seen as a, a, a step too far for the reform league. So, so the reform uh, act came in. Um, many of the people who had houses because of the uh, land association that we mentioned earlier were now eligible to vote, so that gave them votes that allowed them to participate in the election. They built houses up at Kingsley and Abington, a great house building, uh, so this, this association became the Northampton Building Society. Um, it's thought that secularists 
uh, Adam uh, Gurney asked Brad Law to consider standing in Los Angeles in the end of the collection. Um, however, there were, as, as a Liberal candidate, there were two sitting Liberal MPs, Charles Gil Gilpin, who was considered a radical and a, 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 a progressive, and also Lord Henley, who was old fashioned, considered opposed to the board. And Brad Law wanted to challenge him for his seat. Uh, uh, as, a, as a Liberal candidate. In other cities there were competitions, or there was an open competition, for people who wanted to uh, stand as a, as a candidate, but the Northampton Liberals weren't prepared to do that, uh, have that open competition, and this led to many uh, Brad Law supporters and non-conformist radicals uh, supporting Brad Law as a radical candidate uh, uh, against the Liberals, the standing Liberals. Um, so, at that time, the shoemakers were sort of a, a, a large uh, part of the population in Northampton, big supporters of Brad Law. It, it's speculated why the association with shoemakers, and radicalism, and republicanism is sort of interesting and complicated. But uh, one sort of speculation is that most of the people who came into Northampton at that period it came in to work in the industry, came in from like villages within about 20 miles. Northamptonshire is a, uh, a very aristocratic county, a lot of big landowners, so sort that of they would have, if they were not conformists, they would have some sort of Republican anti aristocratic sympathy. Also, the villages were run by the uh, uh, Anglican priests, so they, if they, so they would possibly have a, a, an element of anti clericalism, you know, from there. Uh, would they bring that with them? And that became, in the sort of Northampton, sort of mel melting pot. Uh, you know, they were, uh, well, the, the shoemakers, you know, were, were kind of a strong community. They they worked together in workshops around the town. They had, they used to uh, talk and sing and debate in their workshop. They used to like to drink a lot as well and go to, come and go to the race group. So they had a good, a, a strong community spirit. Also, we had the non-conformists, Baptists and Methodists, um, who, um, had had this affinity with Brad Law from his disputes with the, the vicar here and uh, and against these sort of the Anglican aligned liberal establishment. So when uh, Brad Law announced he was going to stand, there was sort of great enthusiasm. Um, uh, one of the um, Reverend Thomas Allen, the Congregationalist, Nonconformist, uh, oh no, he didn't like Brad Law actually. Um, Councillor Thomas Parker, deacon of the Princess Street Baptist Church, um, threw in slot with Brad Law. Um, however, the minister um, Henry Bradford uh, did not was not a Brad Law supporter. This is the Princess Street Baptist Church. He made a blatantly anti-Brad Law statement suggesting that uh, you could not be a Christian and vote for, uh, for Brad Law. He was aware that members of this congregation of Brad Law support, so this offended a lot of the congregation. The next Sunday he made a similar uh, sermon, and this really created a big split uh, within the church, within the uh, congregation. They had a general meeting, and the congregation sacked Henry Bradford as the minister of the Princess Church. We also had the uh, con congrega Congregationalist Church in um, College Street, just behind the drapery. That was the minister there was um, um, Frederick Aveling, brother of Edward Aveling, the early socialist husband of uh, Eleanor Marx. Um, he was a, uh, a one of the other sort of nonconformists who was a big supporter of Bradlaugh. We also had the, the Catholic community. There was a, a quite a large Catholic community of Irish Catholics who who uh, who'd settled in Northampton around that time. These were navigators, people who helped build the railway in this part of England. They, uh, uh, the, the Catholic priests, were uh, ordered them to not not to support Bradford. They were virulent, virulently opposed to Bradford. But however, um, Edward Keevil, the president of the Irish Reform League, endorsed Bradlaw. Bradlaw uh, had been a supporter of sort of Irish freedom, you know, uh, from his time as a trooper in Ireland in the aftermath of the Great Famine. As a 17 year old, he always supported Irish freedom. So he had the loyal support of the Irish people in the town. Uh, in we, we will 
we'll have a wander up to the market square via the drapery. <laughs> <laughs>